Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. <clears throat> Welcome to this morning Sabbath study. As we return to what we have been studying from Ezekiel 33, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and his guidance in our conversations so that we may more properly examine these words, these instructions, these admonitions to see where they will benefit us. Help us now. May we now join in prayer as we approach the throne of grace. Loving Father in heaven, we appreciate these Sabbath hours. We know that we fall short of your glory. We know, Father, that there are many ways in which we have sinned that we know nothing about. Please forgive us of our sins. Direct us, Father, so that we may do that which you would have us to do. As we open your word and as we take in the words of your prophet, we ask for your guidance. We ask that your angels may attend us. We ask for your blessing so that we might continue to, to con grow in grace and in knowledge of that that you would have us to do. May your spirit enlighten our minds so that we might follow in the way that you would instruct us. Help us to this end. Direct us now, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Now, last Sabbath we were finishing from letter 94, 1892. We come up to this letter that she wrote that followed letter 84 excuse me letter 94 and was written five months and 22 days or roughly 25 252,000 minutes after letter 94 now I'm going to read you the first paragraph of this letter before we jump here into the seventh First paragraph says, I cannot understand the tenor of your letter, and I dare not move in the dark. I would do anything that I thought the Lord would be pleased to have me to do, to have me do to save the soul of my son, but I dare not move on your light. I have been faced too many times with this kind of presentation and done as you will and have been convinced that it was not as God will. I cannot do this again, for I have learned that in place of saving your soul, it has proved to your injury and given you the means to follow your own will in your own course of action. For second paragraph, if your soul is saved, it will be because you have decided you want heaven and not perdition. Satan is well pleased to have you all interwoven with your mother and your brother, and then to place yourself in a position where we are really made responsible for your course of action. Yet, you move independently in so many ways that our brethren have lost confidence in you and in your mother and your brother. This has crippled our influence and placed me in a wrong light before the people. I am hurt all the time hurt. I am disappointed in you. Your Savior is disappointed in you. And the angels of God are disappointed in you. We're now going to jump to the seventh paragraph. I must now stop. I have no words I can use to express my sorrow. Nine months have I been greatly afflicted. But what joy it would be to me to hear that my son was walking in the truth walking in the love and the fear of God. I feel now most surely that although Noah and Job and Daniel were in the land, they could save only their own souls by their own righteousness. They could not save son or daughter. If you rush on in your impetuous spirit, as did Saul, whom the Lord told just what to do, and he did not obey God, but did just contrary. Then with the great light you have had, your case will be proportionately condemned. 
your heart be proportionately stubborn. And I must leave you with a just God, hoping you will have some pity upon your mother and upon your wife. How hard of a letter do you think this was for her to write? I mean, point, point blank, she's <clears throat> talk, talking to Edson White. It, it would have been heartbreaking. I, I, I can imagine myself writing a letter like that to my son. How difficult would that be for you? I don't know that I could write it. Okay. Just because, just because, well, I, again, I can only speak for myself. I've done so much crazy things that to admonish my son. I feel like in, in some ways that I had lost that sense of authority or actual authority in his life. And yet there were times because we worked together a lot. We got our journeyman plumbing ticket together and we, he worked for me. When I ran a company for a few years, he worked for a year for me. And in that time, <clears throat> one time I was instructing him on what to do, and, or we were talking, and I was sharing how I was frustrated sometimes when people, I had to follow behind and fix what they did because they hadn't followed what I had told them to do. And uh, he said, well, I usually do what you tell me to do, he said. I said, well, why? He says, well, you're usually right. So he did have the respect in that sense of seeing that I had a little more experience in things. But uh, in, in the area of spiritual authority, uh, I failed there. So Ellen White has spiritual authority, you know, as a just as a person, because she lives what is right. And... Uh, her son wasn't. So that's that's a human situation for us. We we that's why I say I might not have been able to write it. But we need to be able to write to be able to write a letter like that, we have to first be it. I'm I'm done. Was this Edson experiencing his his own twenty five twenty Revelation. I mean, symbolically, we're being shown with 252,000 minutes that it possibly was. This is the kind of situation that those that are called to be among the 144,000 are going to wind up having when this message goes forward with first the ancient men and then throughout Jerusalem. I make one more plea. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will ye die? In this situation, here we have again Mrs. White referring to Ezekiel 33. With the warnings I have had and given you, I could not be clear in the sight of God to make moves which would only fasten you deeper in the snare of Satan in order to save your feelings. I beg of you not to bring my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Is it not time for self in you to die? Is it not time for you to fall upon the rock and be broken? Is it not time for you to repent before God and be converted that your sins may be blotted out? You have had every advantage, every privilege that one could have, every incentive to do right. But your pride, your independence, and your will have been your hindrance all the way along. <clears throat> Any thoughts on that paragraph? So be aware when she was writing this in the next paragraph, she stated, if you have done wrong in any way, save your soul by confessing your wrong and God will forgive you. Only come to God in contrition and he will pardon. But seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon Call ye upon him while he is near. 
let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon Isaiah 55 6 and 7 however others may think of you and treat you we will stand by you we will sustain you in God and not sustain you while you are separating yourself from God we do not hold out any inducement only the Lord Jesus take him as your savior I cannot put confidence in you aside from this. I am sorry to write this. I am filled with pity for myself and I have that I have to write this. I am filled with pity for you and for me and for Willie. Come to Jesus just as you are. Humble your heart before him and he will pardon. Mr. and Mrs. Mason can do nothing to hurt your soul. You can do more to hurt your own soul than anyone can do to hurt you. If you will only take the right position that we can conscientiously link with you, we will do it, but not before. I write plainly and in love. Do not pervert my words, but take them to heart. It's a very difficult situation to be faced with this. Many of us that are parents, we know that there are issues with many of our children at this point. We look at the mistakes that we've had in our own lives and we have to ask, how can we say to them, turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? This is as personal as it gets. On the seventh day of the 10th month, and of course there's no symbol here, 63 days later, she writes again, I have not written a line to Brother Lindsay or to any others except to Captain Eldridge upon matters that in no way concerned you, but related to himself and to his office. I shall pray for you while I and you shall live. But although Noah and David and Daniel were in the land, they cannot save son or daughter but only deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Did Noah deliver his sons? Did Job deliver his sons or daughters? Yet she makes the comment here about Daniel. And we know that he had no progeny. Yet he placed himself with the children of Israel. It rests wholly with you whether you will ever enter the portals of the city of God. Brothers and sisters, it rests strictly with you whether you will see and enter into the kingdom to come. No pastor, no elder, no minister, no friend, no wife, no husband. It rests only with you. Your own course of action is deciding your case for eternity. How many of us are willing to accept this on our own right now? God will not be trifled with. He has borne long with me. Can you hear it now? I hear you now, brother. What's up? I'm sorry, Dwight. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. You're absolutely fine, brother. Anytime. God has borne long with me. As I have said before, I refuse to point fingers because every time I do, I have three pointing back right at me. God has borne long with me is a thought that I have to place that I have to hold on to and I have to recognize. How much longer will you grieve the Spirit of God? Shall Jesus Christ have died for you in vain? Is she not being very specific in these admonitions? It is not now too late for wrongs to be righted. Not now too late 
for you to throw your soul upon the merits of the blood of a crucified and risen Savior. I have had fears you would pursue your own course until the command would be given, cut down the tree. Why cumbereth it the ground? Where do we find the trees being cut down? Did we not see a tree being cut with only the stump being left where it, can, where it concerned Nebuchadnezzar? And yet the Savior gave us a parable. Cut down the tree. Why cumbereth it the ground? Why does it take up space? Is this to be said of us? I am thinking of tree. Go ahead, please. Dwight, Dwight, hi. You you asked the question about trees. Uh, Is there trees in, was there a a valley of um, idolater? Idolatrous worship, idol, worshiping idols, something to do with trees as well. Were those trees cut down um, with the people? Like, or Like the priests sound, of the grove? Did they cut down a, a trees in the, what was it? A, it's not a valley. It was another name for it. Same thing, but anyway, does that ring any bells? Priest of the Grove. Trees in the Grove. Priest of the Grove is right. Thanks. Thank you. Did, did they cut those trees down? I don't recall. Okay. Question. That's all. Thanks. Okay. Are we just here taking up space, or are we doing that which the Lord would have us to do? I implore you not to venture day after day to follow the leadings of another spirit. Your case afflicts my soul. I have felt so intensely over your case. If you could hear me, I would shout to you across the broad waters, Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Have not these very words been addressed to you from my pen? Do you mean to heed them, or do you mean to wait until death has laid hold upon your mortal body before you will humble your heart to repent and be converted. What are you losing? Time. Golden opportunities to do good. You are turning away from the Lord's messages. Refusing to heed them. Choosing your own course of action. Now is she saying here that we can repent when we've died? What kind of symbol is she using here? And could you expect, my son, that at this distance I should telegraph to you as you desired? I dare not do it. If I lose all my property through the mismanagement of others, I had better do it than through the mismanagement of my own son. I cannot place myself in your hands in any way while you will not place yourself in the hands of God to seek his counsel and to be humbly guided by his wisdom. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Again, Isaiah 55, 6. Have pity on yourself. Have pity, take, have pity on me. And show respect to Jesus Christ, who has brought you with his own blood. May the Lord work for you. I can do nothing more. However good may be your intentions and purposes, Christ says, without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Going on to letter one of 1893, the words spoken were these, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? Ignorant of your sinfulness, you cannot consider your responsibilities to God. All that I am writing to you is truth, but it may all be strange words to you. You do not see that day by day you are manifesting before the world your disloyalty to the God of heaven and are choosing the way of the transgressor, which is sure to secure you the wages of sin, which is death. All the kindness and long suffering of God are prolonged, and you are spared by his mercy and his patience. We come now to letter 24 of 1893, which was not published. 
I've had your case with a number of youth presented before me who are walking in perilous paths. Satan's temptations were upon them. And they were making advanced steps in their own ruin. As the Lord is presented before me continuously, the value of the human soul, I send you the warning given me from the Lord, call a halt. Stop just where you are for your soul's sake. For Christ's sake, repent, 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 before it shall be forever too late. You cannot afford to travel and advance one step farther in your present course of action. You are infatuated, deluded, ensnared by satanic agencies. Satan has exultantly bound you to his chariot. But in the strength of God, you can break the gilded chain. And unless you do this, you are lost. Will you heed these words of warning? I inquire, who hath bewitched you that you should not believe the truth? What power has confused your senses that you cannot see your peril? And that in pursuing this course of action, you will meet with eternal loss. Heaven and eternal life in the world made new is made everything to you. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Ezekiel 33, 11. Long ago you turned your footsteps in the paths that lead to death. Your case has been, pre been presented before me in its aggravated character. Jesus has died for you that you might have eternal life. To separate from God is a fearful thing. To step back under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel and take your position under the black banner of the powers of darkness is a terrible movement for you. The perils of these last days are upon us. Will you be found disloyal to God, a rebel against your creator on the side of the great adversary of Jesus Christ? Where will we be found? Under what banner are we standing? Are we changing leaders and not even know it? For me, it wasn't that long ago that I remember a telephone call that made my blood run cold. I was talking with a friend of long standing. The conversation was very specific. Elder Jeff had decided to retire and he was turning over future for America to another. The telephone call started out bluntly. We have a new leader. Did we learn anything at all from that situation happening? My mind raced when I heard those words. Do we seek to change leaders now? Do we seek to set aside the light that has been coming to us for low these many years. Yeah, Christ has always been our leader. Agreed. Yet what are we seeing all the way around us? There are those that believe Christ is yet their leader. But what happens with their spirit? Did Christ cast out Judas? Or did Judas leave of his own volition? I think he made choices to um, that that led him away from Jesus. I agree. Very much do I agree. Thank you. Watch and pray, my brethren, for your own souls are in imminent peril. For my soul is in imminent peril. Guard yourselves with unceasing vigilance, lest you separate finally from him who has paid the price of his own blood to save the perishing. You each have a soul to save. You each have a soul to lose. And you are in this life to decide your eternal destiny. After so many years training and criticism and passing judgment upon others, you will find it a hard battle to overcome the habit. 
But from the light which the Lord has given me, I'm authorized to say, unless you are converted and have the spirit of a believing, trusting child, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. I speak to you the words of inspiration. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Ezekiel 33, 11. Brother, Brother Prismal, instead of distressing your soul over the faults and failures of others, suppose you lay the burden at the feet of Jesus and say, Here, Lord, I have vexed my soul over other people's doings and perfections, and I have lost love for thee out of my heart. Now I submit these persons to thee. I cannot supply what is lacking in their education and in their manners. And they, and as they are good men and thy delegated servants, wilt thou take them in hand thyself and perfect in them what is lacking? I do not want, I do not want any longer to vex my soul and give the enemy an advantage over me by entertaining a spirit of fault finding and accusing toward those whom thou hast given thy life to save and who love and honor thee. Let me see my own peril. Create in me a new, a clean heart and attract my attention to thine own self that is by steadfastly beholding thee, I may become like thee in character. Are we to look to others or are we to look strictly to Christ? There was every provision made by his satanic majesty to make the most of the opportunities given him to lead all who would be led into temptation, that he could make his suggestions to many minds, and that the light sent from heaven was only fanaticism, excitement, because, af af because the after influence was not of the character to reveal the best fruits. What is she saying here? What are you what are you reading here in this but in this passage? Satan will instill into minds his specious reasonings, because the ones blessed did not cherish and appreciate the divine enlightenment, and their hearts were not filled with awe and love that God has blessed and sanctified them through the truth. Instead of using their God given powers to devise means that they could accomplish good and communicate that which they had received worshiping God in spirit and in truth, they ate and drank and rose up to play. They perverted and misapplied the rich grace of God and bowed their soul powers to worship an idol, just as Satan laid his plans that they should do through resuming their amusements in games and plays which led away from watchfulness and prayer. How many idols do we have that need to be cleared away? How is this written for us today? And are we willing to take these admonitions to heart? Had these students allowed the Holy Spirit to use them, they would have aroused as living missionaries to work in Christ's fine. They could not have considered their individual responsibility to work in every way possible in harmony with Christ, their pattern to save souls ready to perish. Instead of showing themselves faithful sentinels for Jesus Christ, the enemy should not steal a march upon them and convert their soul temples into desecrated shrines. They threw wide open the gates and invited the enemy to come in. The Lord demanded the homage of the heart, rendering to him undivided, wholehearted service, the cheerful obedience of every power of the mind and the soul. Souls are perishing out of Christ. There is work to be done to enlighten, to warn. Holy characters are de to be presented to the world to represent the power of sacred truths upon human hearts. God's calls are earnest and emphatic to the sinner. He calls, turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Who is calling after Christ? 
You have no time for repining now. No time for unbelief now. No time to let go of Jesus. Now is the time when trial comes to press close to the bleeding side of Jesus. When the whole world was under condemnation, Christ took upon himself the guilt of the sinner. He bore the wrath of God for the transgressor. And thus suffering the penalty of sin, he ransoms the sinner. Had it been the choice of God to destroy the disobedient, he might in justice have swept the earth clean of the guilty transgressors. But he reveals himself as a compassionate, loving father. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Ezekiel 33, 11, and Ezekiel 18, 32. The Son of God bore the contradiction of sinners against himself. Behold his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Hear his thrice-repeated prayer. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Sweating great drops of blood in his human agony, he added, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew 26, 39. Hath then God no knowledge of his suffering creatures? Behold the spirit betrayed. Behold the Savior betrayed. Mocked, derided in the judgment hall. Who was this? The Prince of Life, the Holy, and the Beloved of God. Continuing to letter 43. Visiting the sick, comforting the poor, and the sorrowful, for Christ's sake, will bring to the workers the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. And even the countenance will express the peace that dwells in the soul. The faces of men and women who talk with God, to whom the invisible world is a reality, express the peace of God. They carry with them the soft and genial atmosphere of heaven and diffuse it in deeds of kindness and the works of love. Their influence is of a character to win souls to Christ. If all could see and understand and be doers of the words of God, what peace what happiness, what health of body and peace of soul would be the result. A warm, kindly atmosphere of love, the pitying tenderness of Christ in the soul cannot be estimated. The price of love is above gold and silver and precious stones and makes human agents like him who lived not to please himself. I am sorry that there are those in positions of trust who have who very sparingly cultivate the sympathy and tenderness of Christ. They do not even cultivate and manifest love toward their brethren and sisters who are in the faith. They do not exercise the precious tact that should bind and heal those who go astray, but instead they exhibit cruelty of spirit that drives the wanderer still further into the dark and makes angels weep. Some seem to find a sort of pleasure in bruising and wounding souls who are ready to die. As I look upon men who handle sacred truth, who bear sacred responsibilities, and who are failing to cultivate a spirit of love and tenderness, I feel like crying out, turn ye, turn ye, or why will you die? When I consider the fact that as probationers, we are now forming characters that will either fit us for the society of heavenly angels or delegate us to a place with those who are outside the city of God, I tremble for these men. Oh, if there were no rousing up of evil passions in the heart of these who claim to be God's agents, how much more reasonable consideration would be given to questions of serious importance? How does heaven look upon human agents who are void of the milk of human kindness? What do you think? What do you see from this paragraph? Well, you know, everything that we do in our interactions with others is to be redemptive. 
right? And and so much what I see that uh, tries to disguise itself as concern for others is really nothing more than an attack and also really what? A, an attack and the defending of of self that it's an avoiding avoiding dealing with our own problems so um, I mean the reason why we are not to condemn others is you know he that judges another man does the same things we need to we need to be able to look at ourselves and see when we have an attitude towards others why do we have that attitude and you know those who can actually like seem to take pleasure in in you know quenching whatever spiritual life exists in somebody through condemnation um it, it, it's just a, not redemptive. It, yeah. There, there's a word for that, which I don't know if I can pronounce right. It's a German word, Schadenfreude, Schadenfreude. And that's what you're describing, really, is taking delight in the fall of an enemy, or taking the delight in the fall of anyone, really, that you don't like or something. That's, yeah, Schadenfreude. And, and we see that in, in, all the sports today and so on, but we see it all as you described. They're uh, giving unsolicited advice in the guise of somehow exposing the person, or how did you put it, Theodore? I Correcting don't someone, but, but, but yeah, oh, okay. people are, are okay. ready to attack others um, and not really. And, and it's a way of, of avoiding dealing with their own problems. Okay. Now, she continued on in letter 51A. My brother, why do you cherish such bitterness against elders E.T. Jones and Elder Wagner? It is for the same reason that Cain hated Abel. Cain refused to heed the instructions of God. And because Abel sought God and followed his will, Cain killed him. God has given Brother Jones and Wagner a message for the people. You do not believe that God has upheld them, but he has given them precious light, and their message has fed the people of God. When you reject the message borne by these men, you reject Christ, the giver of the message. Why will you encourage the attributes of Satan? Why will you and Brother Henry despise God's delegated ministers and seek to justify yourselves? Your work stands revealed in the sight of God. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? So, this letter, letter 51A of 1895. When we take a look at this, we find a brother having been very blunt. His name was Harmon Lindsay. Harmon. Have we ever heard that name before? What was Ellen White's maiden name? Must have been a name common of the day, perhaps. I mean, it's an interesting connect. It's an interesting connection as well to yes, Ellen Harmon family maiden name. Yes. It's also interesting because Lindsay, here you have Harmon, Army Man, Lindsay, Island of Linden Trees, or as some would also say, Lincoln's Marsh. Now, this brother, Harmon Lindsay, along with Brother Henry, apparently were at the 1888 general conference session and they chose to despise the meaning of the message that was given are we not seeing this same attitude regarding the message of Jones and Wagner today 
the Lord has appealed to you again and again, rebuking your stubborn, unbelieving spirit. But rather than fall on the rock and be broken, you become the graft of a strange vine, which in the end will be gathered up and burned. It is difficult for you to throw off the religious faith that you have so long professed, but you are not a Christian at heart. For you do not bear the fruits of the spirit of Christ. Is the same to be said of us today? The power is working in you, seeking to extinguish the bright beams of Christ's righteousness, which for so many years you have refused to receive. Judas might have been disciplined by the lessons of Christ, as were the other disciples, but he refused to receive and to practice the words of Christ. Are we today in a similar condition? Am I today in a similar condition? Though he was thought by the other disciples to be a faithful follower of Christ, he was not transformed in character. He had a formal connection with the little church of disciples, but he had not a heart connection with Christ. Are we today experiencing the same situation? Am I a Christian in name only, but refusing the heart connection with Christ? These are questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Letter 87 of 1895. You cannot afford to lose your soul. And if you trust in Jesus, you will not. Come to Jesus every day just as you are. And in meekness and lowliness of heart, abide in Christ from the strife of tongues. Persevere in your wrestlings until you With joyous heart, you learn that there is a God in Israel. With hearts all subdued and broken, give the invitation to all. Come, for all things are now ready. Luke 14, 17. With longing desire, with longing loving entreaty, even as a father yearns toward his children, so give the invitation to lost souls. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Ezekiel thirty-three eleven. Satan is exceedingly angry that God has pity on you and that you are an agent through whom he may rescue other souls. Work humbly. And you will have souls for your hire. Let not Satan triumph that he has worked through human agents to hedge up your way. As in the days of Christ, men say, show us a miracle. Have you ever been confronted with this? Have you ever heard from others? If this is of God, why are we not able to do the works of God? Why? Are we not able to perform the miracles? Christ is continually working miracles. Miracles are wrought among us in transformation of human character. When his human agents who have been controlled by stubborn wayward fancies, who have been tossed to and fro, and who have had no peace under the conflicting influences of the spirit of the world that opposes itself to the work of the spirit of God, are set free and yield themselves wholeheartedly to the drawing of God's heavenly agents. There is a miracle wrought. There is a miracle wrought when a man who has been under strong delusion comes to understand moral truth. He hears the voice saying, turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? When he turns from falsehood to truth, from sin to righteousness, He is made a temple for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As he goes on from one act of obedience to another, he sows spiritual seed and reaps a glorious harvest of truth. Every time a soul is converted, a miracle is wrought by the Holy Spirit of God. And for this, we should give God continual praise. The promise of God is fulfilled when he says, A new heart also will I give thee. 
Ezekiel 36, 26. A new song is put into the mouth of the repentant sinner. And he proclaims the way of salvation to those around him. In the meetings that were held while we were in Melbourne, the spirit of the Lord was manifested. And many excellent testimonies were borne by those who had experienced the converting power of God. Now, we are coming close to our time, the end of our time in today's study. Before we go on to the next document, do we have any comments or thoughts with what we have addressed so far today? So um, the basic idea that you started out with is there's this um, 2520 symbol in connection with, um, now what was the span of time? Where was it from? It, so she wrote this letter to Edson and you had five months and 22 days, but where are you, are you counting it from? Okay. We have this letter that we started, letter 56 of 1892. Now, this was begun. Let's see. This letter was written. Yeah, because it didn't, it wasn't really clear. Exactly. So the fourth day, 26th of October of 1892. And it was okay. the initial letter that we were talking about last week, letter 94 of 1892. May, that, that was May 5th or something? What was it? Hang on. I'll get it in just a second. That was... May 5th of 1892, yes. Yeah, so 174 days. And, yeah, so it it ends up being 250,560 minutes. So you got, but, so that's what I have. But are you adding another day to that? Do an inclusive count then? Yes, I am. Okay, so an inclusive count is, yeah, 252,000 minutes. Okay. okay. So that becomes a symbol of of, of, of a 2520, and, and it's for her son, Essence, so it becomes typical of a message to us. Okay. Right? So a warning to us. Okay. Okay, now, so the, that was the idea. The other point that, that's given from the chat if counting from yeah. the start of the year, it would span to June twenty second. Yeah. So if you count that um, span of time in a year, any year, uh, it's going to give you so June twenty second, which is the date that we have for FFA. Right. So the hundred and that means it's the hundred and seventy fourth day of the year, around. I haven't checked that, and I know that months are different lengths, but um, you could sort of parallel them just because it yeah. represents that same span. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that would be um, 174 cardinal days from, uh, let me see here. You know, no, that would be the 174th day of the year in, uh, let me see here. So, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So yeah, 174 days from the beginning of the year to June 22nd gives you that yeah, 20, 252,000 uh, minutes. Okay. So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks, Dwight. You bet. So does does that bring the rest of this home? Do we? Do we all now see this, these symbols and how they can relate to us? Sorry, my dog is being just a little rambunctious at the moment. Okay. And then the comment in the chat again on changing the leader. Minneapolis, Minnesota, October 24th of 1888. How much would you like to read, Kelly? Uh, 
just a paragraph or two. Okay, go ahead. Or yeah. later. Well, I think I think it uh, you'll find it re relevant. Um, okay, hold on. I was trying to share the share the reading, but that's okay. I'll just read it. Okay, go ahead. A um, couple of thoughts. A couple of thoughts. Actually, uh, you'd asked about, or no, you had mentioned, without me, you can do nothing. When she was uh, writing the letter to her son. What right. year was that? That was 1890-something when she wrote I, that letter? All of these. And I'm, and I'm seeing it. Go ahead. No, go ahead. All of them. Okay. I believe um, these letters were all written from 1892 so, to 1895. What was the start? 1892. 1890. Thank you. Okay, so, yeah, what I'm seeing is the things she is so writing in this, here. we may well be three and a half year period. Okay. Okay. And uh, what I'm seeing here is like copy and paste almost from her sermons in 1888 to the General Conference. It's quite interesting. Um I'll just share a couple of thoughts on how that relates to what you're speaking of. I hope that at the beginning of this meeting, our hearts, oh, well, this is actually from October 18, 1888. I hope that at the beginning of this meeting, our hearts may be impressed with the positive statement of our Savior. Without me, ye can do nothing. We have a great and solemn truth committed to us for these last days, but a mere assent to and belief in this truth will not save us. The principles of truth must be interwoven with our character and life. We should cherish every ray of light that falls upon our pathway and live up to the requirements of God. We should grow in spirituality. Okay. We are losing a great deal of the blessing we might, ha might have at this meeting because we do not take advanced steps in the Christian life as our duty is presented before us, and this will be an eternal loss. Here she repeats to... Ideas, eternal loss, and without me you can do nothing. Now, the other one is a morning talk, and this is, this occurred, I related this to the change of leaders, or leadership, leaders, a leader. Now our meeting is drawing to a close, and not one confession has been made. There has not been a single break so as to let the Spirit of God in. Now I was saying, what was the use of our assembling here together and for our ministering brethren to come in if they are here only to shut out the Spirit of God from the people? We did hope that there would be a turning to the Lord here. Perhaps you feel that you have all you want. Come on, rates one here, yeah. Never, I'm going to skip ahead, oh. Had Brother Kilgore been walking closely with God, he never would have walked onto the ground as he did yesterday and made the statement he did in regard to the investigation that is going on. That is, they must not bring in any new light or present any new argument. Notwithstanding, they have been constantly handling the Word of God for years, yet they are not prepared to give a reason of the hope they have because one man is not here. Have we not all been looking into this subject? I never was more alarmed than at the present time. Now, I have been taken down through the first rebellion. I saw the workings of Satan, and I know something about this matter that God has opened before me. And should I not, should not I be alarmed? And then to take the position that because Elder Butler was not here, that that subject should not be taken up. I know this is not of God, and I shall not feel free until I have told you. Here was the enemy inculcating his ideas into the hearts of the angels, and they express these ideas that he has inculcated as their own. And Satan takes them and tells them to other angels as the sentiments of the angels he has been working with. And thus, he inculcates his ideas into their minds and then draws them out of the angels as their own ideas. Now, I am full of pain as I view these things, and how can I help it? Do you think that when I see these things transpiring, that I can keep still and say nothing when these things have been shown to me? I want to tell you, brethren, that it is not right 
to fasten ourselves upon the idea ideas of any one man. And that's yeah, his lot there. There is. We cannot afford to look to man for our guidance. We are to look only and strictly to Christ and to his Father. Any other thoughts or any other questions from what we've been addressing today? If I may, one more sentence further down. Sure. Let us let us come to God as reasonable beings to know for ourselves what is truth. But if you want to take a position that only one man can explain the truth, I want to tell you that this is not as God would have it. Now, I want harmony. The truth is a unit. But if we fasten to any man, we are not taking the position that God would have us take. We want to investigate every line of truth, especially if it bears the signet of God. Can you tell in what way God is going to give us new truth? Again, this I thought jumps off the page to me of the ideas. Isn't it man interesting taking... that she is giving such a very pointed hmm. statement here? Mm -hmm. And where did you and... find this? Where was this? Uh, that's in the uh, chat. The reference is there as well. It's uh, 1888 sermon, 1888 materials, uh, 1987 compilation, chapter 16, morning talk. The, uh, yeah. All right. Any other comments? Shall we then close our session with prayer? Loving Father in heaven. We thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you for this time that we have spent together as we have taken in the truths that you have presented, the symbols that you are showing, the relevance for which these are to us today. Help us now. May we do that which is most necessary so that our characters may be fitted for admission to the courts of your city. May your will be done today in our lives as your will is done in heaven. Direct us to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.